Welcome to Parsha Insights. This week, the Parsha that we're going to be reading is the single Parsha Bahar. Why I say single is because in most years, non-leap years, the Parsha of Bahar is read together with the next Parsha, B'chukosai. But because this is a leap year, we have a few extra weeks, we read it separately. That means that the focus is not on the combined message of both holidays, both Torah readings, rather, but the focus is on the single Torah portion that we're going to be reading this week. And what is the name of the Parsha? Behar, on the mountain. What is the context? God speaks to Moses on Mount Sinai. And what did he tell him? To tell the Jewish people, the children of Israel, about the laws of the sabbatical year that when they come to the land the land has to rest on the sabbatical year which we'll get into a little bit more as we go on but the puzzling thing for people who realize that names are not arbitrary especially names that are used by the jewish people for hundreds maybe thousands of years the name behar means the mountain what is the lesson that we learn from the word mountain now at first glance people would say that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. So that's a very important message. Just the mere fact the Torah was given on Mount Sinai is significant. Why? Because, as our sages tell us, Mount Sinai is the lowest of all the mountains in that region. That God chose the lowest mountain to, to indicate that in order for us to be receptive to Torah, we must have humility. Ethics of the Fathers begins with the words, Moshe Kibbal Torah Messinai. Moses received the Torah from Sinai, from Mount Sinai. And the question is, why is it important to tell us that he got it from Mount Sinai? He got it from God, not from Mount Sinai. He got it on Mount Sinai. So one of the answers is that Moses' worthiness of receiving the Torah is because he emulated the message of Sinai, of Mount Sinai, which is the lowest of all the mountains. Moses was the most humble of all people, as the Torah itself testifies. And therefore, Moses was able to receive the Torah because the most important ingredient in being receptive to Torah is humility, and he had that humility. So that explains why the Parsha is called Bahar on the mountain, because we want to emphasize the importance of Mount Sinai as a prerequisite for the giving of the Torah. And since we read this parsha two weeks before Shavuot, before the holiday in which we celebrate the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, it makes sense that the parsha should be focusing on the very salient aspect of the preparations for the Torah, which was to learn the lesson of humility from Mount Sinai. But the problem still persists because the, the name of the parsha should not be Bahar itself, which stresses just the mountain. It should be Bahar Sinai, Mount Sinai, which is the lowest of all mountains. And yet, the, this parsha is referred to universally as the parsha Bahar. But then there's even more basic question: If God wanted to teach us the lesson that mounts that we have to be humble to receive the Torah, then the Torah should have been given in a valley. Why was it given in a mountain? True, it's the lowest of mountains, but it's still a mountain. So the answer to both of these questions the Rebbe gives is that when you receive the Torah, you need humility, but humility has to be sometimes coupled with a healthy dose of mountain, that you are proud of who you are as a Jew, you're proud to be the one who receives the Torah. Because if you're a pushover and you have no self-respect and no pride in who you are, then it'll be very easy for people to push you away from the Torah, to be influenced by other forces that militate against the Torah, because we are very much social creatures and we're affected by our environment, we're affected by our peers, in fact, the opening of the Code of Jewish Law is do not be deterred by those who mock you. 
When God took the Jews out of Egypt, he didn't want to take them through the land of the Philistines, the Gaza, because he was afraid that they would be deterred. And why would they be deterred by going through the land of the Philistines? So one explanation is that the Philistines were mockers, were cynics. They would mock everything. They would laugh at, at everyone. And if the Jews would be subjected to that type of cynicism early on in their existence, they would have gone back to Egypt. They would have lost their identity as a nation. So we are so influenced by our surroundings that we have to have a healthy dose of self-respect, especially if we're in a position of leadership. We can't allow everyone step on us and trot upon us because then we will not be effective leaders. So the parsha's focus here is Bihar, the mountain. The Jew has to be a mountain, but if you want to know which mountain, it's the lowest mountain. It has to be coupled with humility. Now, what was the message over here? So the Torah goes on to talk about the sabbatical year, that seven every seven years in Israel, the land has to rest. We're not allowed to work on the land. We're not allowed to claim any ownership to the land. It's free for all to take. Now, Rashi asked the question, Ma inyan shmita etzel har Sinai. What's the reason the Torah juxtaposes the mountain, Sinai mountain, to the laws of the sabbatical year? Weren't all commandments given on Mount Sinai? So then why does the Torah have to emphasize that this commandment was spoken to on Mount Sinai? Every mitzvah, it doesn't say that by every other mitzvah, when the Torah talks about a mitzvah of love your fellows yourself, it doesn't say God said it on Mount Sinai. It's obvious. All the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. So why does the Torah have to emphasize it here? So Rashi answers, this is to tell you that just like the sabbatical year laws are given over in vivid detail in this parsha, because most commandments are mentioned in the Torah very generally, without the specifics, without the details. Here the Torah goes into detail. And the Torah emphasizes that this was all given on Mount Sinai. This is to set the tone and to establish a precedent that all the commandments that were given on Mount Sinai were not just given in rudimentary form without detail, but they were given with great detail with all the specifics. When Moses went up on the mountain and he came down with the tablets, he didn't just come down with tablets, he came down with the information of all the 613 commandments with their specifics, with their nu nuances, with every little detail. But the question still remains, that lesson could have been taught by any other mitzvah. If the Torah would have mentioned Mount Sinai with respect to another mitzvah, we would have said the same thing, that just like that mitzvah was given in detail, so too, all the mitzvahs were given in detail on Mount Sinai. Why was the sabbatical year mitzvah chosen as the paradigm for all mitzvahs? So the Chassam Sofer, one of the great 19th century sages, gives a very interesting explanation. He says, this commandment, more than any other commandment, actually proves that the Torah was given to us in Mount Sinai. Because this commandment carries with it a very unusual guarantee. The Torah goes on to say that you have to let the land remain fallow. You can't work on the land. So the question is, and the Torah actually tells us what the question, if you're going to ask, what are we going to eat? You plant food on the six years you produce food. The seventh year, you don't produce food, so you have no food for the seventh year and no food for the eighth year because you're not planting in the seventh year. So what are people going to eat? So God says, and the Torah mentions this, that I will command my blessing that in the sixth year there will be enough food produced then that will satisfy you for the sixth year, for the seventh year, and for the eighth year. Now, who can make a guarantee like that? Which, which uh, religion would establish itself on a premise that a miracle will happen if you observe this commandment, if you observe this mitzvah. You could promise people in very generic ways, you'll have a good life, you'll, be, you'll prosper, and you could get away with that and promising that even if it doesn't happen. But to say that the sixth year will produce for three years, for that you have to have something more 
uh, uh, official that it's coming from, that's obviously coming from God who gave us the Torah. So therefore, since this is the mitzvah that proves the divine origin of the Torah, it's the appropriate mitzvah to serve as the paradigm for all the mitzvahs. That's one, one approach. And maybe as we go on, we'll be able to provide another approach. Now, even though we're not reading next week's parsha, but next week's parsha has a continuation of the theme of the sabbatical year in terms of the punishment that the Jewish people suffered as a result of them not keeping the sabbatical year during the first temple era. This is being written in the Torah when the Jews were still in the desert. And the Torah promised them that if they don't keep the sabbatical year, the land will expel them. If they don't respect the integrity of the land, the land will expel them. Again, this is a very powerful statement, because, and that came true. After the first temple was destroyed, the Babylonian Empire exiled most of the Jews from Israel to Babylonia. So that was a fulfillment of the Torah's threat that if we don't observe the sabbatical year, we will be sent out of the land. What is the reason for this very harsh punishment? I mean, true, we don't observe a commandment. God has a right to threaten us with punishment. But a punishment of exile, with all of its attendant negativities, the the death of so many people, the, the way people were destroyed, the land was pillaged, this is, seems to be too harsh for just failure to observe one of the commandments. Although it says that there were other things they did wrong, like murder, which is a little bit more serious, everyone would agree. But it seems that the Torah focuses on the sabbatical year, that that's the reason that they were exiled. So there are two explanations for it. One explanation that it's not really a punishment. It's cause and effect. There are two ways of looking at a punishment, that punishments in the Torah. One could look at it as tit for tat. God says, don't do this. If you do it, I'll punish you. It's like a father tells his son, if you don't do your homework, I'm going to deny you a privilege. You won't be able to go on the trip. One is a response to the other, but it's not an effect of the other. But sometimes a punishment is cause and effect. If a person cuts his finger and it bleeds and it's painful, you're not going to say the person was punished tit for tat. No, it's a natural consequence of the action. Here, too, being driven out of the land was a natural consequence of not respecting the integrity of the land. The Midrash tells us that the reason why the Jews were given the land of Israel and it doesn't cannot go to anyone else is because it's like a tailor-made suit. Tailor-made for one person. If that person, if, if someone, it gives it away to someone else, they could be the same height, the same weight. It won't fit because every person has different contours. Every person is different and it's tailor-made for one person. The land of Israel was tailor-made for the Jewish people. But the Jewish people, what happens if you have a suit designed for you and you lose 40 pounds? It's not going to fit anymore. You gain 40 pounds. It's not going to fit anymore. You have to have it retailored. Well, when the Jewish people l- lose some of their spiritual weight, or maybe a better metaphor, if they gain some weight, unnecessary weight, whichever is the better metaphor, the suit doesn't fit. The land doesn't fit anymore. The land just expelled them. That's one explanation. Another explanation is that the land belongs to the Jewish people because God created it. That's our claim to the land. People who try to use the argument of the Balfour Declaration, the UN Declaration, even the historical argument that we were there for thousands of years. All these arguments could be refuted or could be countered. The same UN that gave us the land could take it away. You look at the UN today. The UN is totally against Israel, and for all intents and purposes, the UN is hardly a basis for our claim to Israel. Likewise, history. 
history has changed. Yeah, they were, they, you can you can have a history, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you that the history will continue on. The only claim we have to the land, as Rashi explains in the very first comment on Genesis, is that God created the world, and he created the land. He gave it to whom he pleased. He gave it to us. First, he gave it to the Canaanites to warm the the, the, the seat, you could say, and now he gave it to us, and now it belongs to us and to no one else. And since God gave us the land, no one was able to colonize it. Look at what happened in Gaza, even in more recent times. Israel made the place flourish. Gush Katif was a flourishing place. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And it was such a productive place. As soon as it was given away to the people who inhabited it, they destroyed it. They just they couldn't they couldn't really settle it in a way that would make it prosper. Whatever the reason is, it just is a reality that only the Jewish people could fit into the land of Israel. And therefore, if the Jewish people don't respect the divinity of the land, they say, look, I'm not going to rest on the seventh year because I don't believe that God is going to make it give us more food on the sixth year. You deny God's role by not acknowledging that the land is God's, by resting on that land, then if you don't have God as your basis for the land, then you don't have any claim to the land. That's why it was so tragic. This is a historical reality. In 1948, when they declared the state of Israel, which people celebrate as the Day of Independence, but there's a very sad part to it, because there was a big debate, should they mention God's name? in the Declaration of Independence. And they ruled no. They're going to use a very uh, parava, a very n- unclear designation. Instead of saying God, they said the rock of Israel. Let those religious people think it means God. Let the secular people think it means Jewish might, Jewish power. Well, we see how Jewish power sometimes brings us victory. And look what happened on October 7th. With all of our Jewish power, with all of our military, our Mossad, the most sophisticated weaponry, a bunch of thugs, of murderous thugs, were able to murder 1,200 of our, of our brethren. So it's not our weapons, which we need, and we have to use them when they're necessary, but we have to recognize it's God who brings us victory, and it's God who gives us the right to the land. By observing the sabbatical land, that's the way we d- demonstrate very clearly that we believe that God is in control of this land, that therefore we don't, we would never be exiled. As soon as the people forgot God's role in the land, they were exiled. And maybe that explains why the Torah uses the sabbatical year as the paradigm for Sinai. Because like the very concept of the sabbatical year is a demonstration of your belief that the land of Israel was given to us by God, it's the same God who gave us the Torah. And that the only way Israel has any, we have any right to Israel if it conforms to Sinai. If you separate Sinai from the sabbatical year, then the sabbatical year will not endure and we won't have any claim to the land. Then it says, you shall declare freedom. What is that talking about? After the seven years, you have a sabbatical year, the seventh year, then you count seven years, seven times, seven cycles, and the 50th year is made holy and is called Yovel, the Jubilee year. And what happens in the Jubilee year? It's just like a sabbatical year. So you had two sabbatical years, one next to the other. The 49th year was a sabbatical year, and the 50th year. But the additional factor was that in the Jubilee year, people who were indentured servants would go free, and the land that you purchased would go back to its original owners or their heirs. So when you bought real estate in Israel and, you would, and, it, was, and you, it was not part of your fair family heirloom, you could only buy it for the total of 50 years. Then you could repurchase it, but it was only like a 50-year sale, and the land would go back to the original owner. But the point that we want to focus on now is that it says in the 50th year, you should proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. What does that mean, declare freedom? If you were an indentured servant, what is an indentured servant? If someone was caught stealing, for example, 
and had no way of repaying it, he would be sold to a master as a servant, not as a slave, because you could always get out of it. If you can repay the money that was paid for you, you go out free. Also, after six years, you go out automatically. So there are many ways of getting out of that indentured servitude. But if you insisted on staying after six years, they would bore your, a hole in your ear, which we won't go into right now, and you would stay on until the Yovel, until the Jubilee year, and then you would go free. So the Torah here declares that it's freedom for all of its inhabitants. So the question is asked, what does that mean, all of its inhabitants? It's only for a very small group of people, an indentured servant, an indentured servant who refuses to leave after six years. So how many people would be in that category? A A small, very tiny amount of individuals. Yet it says, declare freedom for the whole world, for everyone, for all its inhabitants. So the question is asked by commentators, and the Pnei Yoshua, one of the great Talmudic commentators who lived in the 18th century, uh, he gives the answer that the Talmud says when you purchased an indentured servant known as an Eved Ivri, you actually bought a master for yourself. You are as much a servant as your servant is because if you had one pillow, you had to give it to your servant. If you had one steak for dinner, you had to give it to your servant. If you had two, you can keep one for yourself as well. You had to treat, you couldn't ask him to do any demeaning work. You didn't really, it was not like a slave. He was a servant, he was an employee, and he had more rights than any employee has in our society today. So who is the one who is not free? The servant, because he has a, he has a contract, he has to be there for six years, and the master is also a servant, so you're also bringing freedom, not just for the servant, but also for the master. But that's only a partial answer, because how many masters are there of indentured servants? But the truth is that we could expand that on that and say that in a certain sense, we're all masters. You could be a master and a servant. We're masters. If you're a parent, you're a master. If you're a teacher, you're a master. If you're an employer, you're a master. If you're a physician, you're a master to your patients. The whole world is divided into givers and receivers. You could be both, a giver and a receiver, a giver in one area and receiver in another area. But in that area that we are masters, we have to recognize that when it comes to the Jubilee year, and the Jubilee year doesn't have to mean we have to wait 50 years, it means when we have this understanding of the Jubilee year, we have to recognize that we have to let go of the servitude. We cannot exercise inordinate control over the people over whom we have influence. Because there's a very well-known saying that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Whenever a person is in the position where they're the giver, they, they have something over you because you're the recipient. You need them, and that gives them power. And power gives them certain amount of energy and they they're loath to give it up and people who have power are likely to try to gain keep that power and never let go of it and increase their power and that's wrong so the torah tells us that we have to take this lesson of the jubilee year that every now and then we have to reflect on our role as givers people with power and to recognize that that power is not absolute, that we have to give up that power and recognize that we are not the ones who are in power. It's God whose power controls everything. And this might be the hint in the Liberty Bell. You know, this verse, you shall declare freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants is inscribed on the Liberty Bell that's cracked. And I think what it means, and it's a hint, is that we are living in Gullus, we're living in exile. So this freedom that is associated with the Jubilee year is something that we're lacking. We're lacking in that ability to declare freedom for everyone because as long as, long as we're in exile, and even though we may have come to the point where we're free, 
there's still others who are not free. And as long as someone else is not free, our freedom is also compromised. And that's why you could say that by divine providence, the symbol of freedom is cracked. Because it's a sign that we, we, we cherish freedom, we want to have freedom as much as possible, want to give up some of that control and mastery, but that freedom is not enjoyed by everyone because there are people who are still suffering in exile, and especially nowadays where we're seeing so much tragedy going on in the land of Israel. So and no Jew could feel t- total freedom. We all feel the pain, and we cry out, we want Mashiach, and we want Mashiach now. 